Today we're joined by Peter Todd, a core Bitcoin developer and chief scientist of the MasterCoin Foundation. Peter, thanks for joining me today on Let's Talk Bitcoin. Yeah, you're welcome. So I listed two of your projects, but you're actually pretty prolific. I recently saw that you're going to be auditing the counterparty protocol. I want to know, are there any other projects that you'd like to name drop that people should check out? I think what's kind of interesting about what MasterCoin's done with my role as chief scientist is we see it that, you know, decentralized finance is so small as a field that we shouldn't really be thinking in terms of being in competition with each other as much as being in competition with centralized finance. So even though I work, you know, as chief scientist at MasterCoin, like you said, I'm also auditing counterparty and I'm also uh, helping out with colored coins work as well. I think that's the ethos, frankly, to be moving forward right now. There's so much room for collaboration, so much stuff that needs to be built. And we're all kind of rowing in the same direction here anyways. So since it's all open source, you know, I think this is the way that it makes a lot of sense to do. So I'm glad to see you guys are taking that ethos. And that's been true pretty much of all my interactions with MasterCoin folks. The reason why we're having this conversation today isn't actually about MasterCoin. It's about stealth addresses, which are something that you yep. started talking about, I guess, a couple of months ago. Let's pretend for a second that I haven't done any research and that I'm just some schmo of a podcaster. What's a stealth address and why is it relevant mm -hmm. to me? I think what it really comes down to is it makes it easier for you to do the right thing with regard to privacy. Because a you know, Bitcoin address is something that whatever you do with it, is publicly visible. So what it comes down to is if you use a Bitcoin address twice, you know, you are linking information about your transactions. You're essentially saying, all right, I did this transaction, then I did this transaction. Potentially I did a whole bunch of them. And that's information that you, you don't necessarily want other people to know. A great example is, all right, you get paid by your company every month. Do you want every single paycheck to end up on the same address so that it's kind of obvious how much you're getting paid and you know how often it is and so on? You're much better off if that information isn't public. And to make that possible, well, you have to figure out how do you, you know, how do you receive a payment from someone twice without using the same address? And all a stealth address is is just a bit of cryptography math so that you can essentially give someone else this piece of data that lets them then construct addresses that can pay you. And even though they're not linked publicly, your wallet can still recover the funds from them and still spend them. So these are like, I, I want to say it's something like hierarchical deterministic, you know, client side wallets where, where the sender generates it. I mean, like, explain this to me more. I, I don't understand. So you brought up HD wallets and an HD wallet is potentially another way of doing this kind of thing in that with an HD wallet, you could potentially give someone else what's sort of called the root. And then from that root pub key, they can then also derive addresses. And then you can set up your wallet software to look for addresses that could have been derived from that root. The problem with it is it's kind of inflexible because the only thing you can really do is you can say have address number one, number two, et cetera. If your wallet doesn't have to be looking at the right address or, you know, maybe the numbers get out of match or something, or, you know, you really want to actually give this to two people because it's more convenient. You know, it's just, it's a lot of overhead and a lot of complexity to it from your user's point of view. But fundamentally, yes, you're right. I mean, it is a way of giving someone a piece of information from which then they can drive multiple addresses to pay you. So, you know, with that respect, yeah, they are very similar. This is helpful to me then because like, let's talk Bitcoin as a podcast. We would put out this piece of information about us and then people would be able to use that to derive addresses that they could send money to us. We wouldn't have generated the address. They generated the address for us and it routes yeah. to us, right? Yeah. And this is a key problem with HD wallets. Let's suppose you wanted a donation address or you didn't want it to be public, who has donated to you and how much? If you just publish an HD wallet address, the problem is that both sides of the sending of the funds and receiving of the funds essentially have to regenerate the same address. So if we have the root and then we add, generate address number one, on your side, you also have to generate address number one and look for it in the blockchain. So if it's donation address, well, what index do you use? If I'm going to donate money to you, my wallet software somehow has to find an index that hasn't been already used and then 
not have that space, that search space of indexes be too big, because otherwise your wallet software is then having to go search for thousands of possible addresses. So you get this very hard to achieve trade-off that, you know, in practice adds a lot of overhead and isn't really practical in a lot of cases. So then what's the use for these things? I think for um, an HG wallet route, for the use case of, you know, you giving an address someone to pay you, it does probably work in cases where there's a one-to-one relationship. I mean, I could say give my employer HG wallet route, and because they know which addresses of that chain they've used, it's easy for them to use a new one each time, you know, with a bit of bookkeeping. So this is more like setting up a direct deposit relationship with your employer than it is being able to just give an address to all your friends and have it so that they can anonymously pay you because they all aren't keeping track of who's sending what payments to you at what point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's not, that's not a bad description. Yeah. I I think at the technical level, that description kind of misses a lot of stuff, but in terms of what the user experience is, yeah, I think that's quite correct. Well, I'll, I'll believe that I'm missing some stuff on the uh, technical level. That's definitely true. (laughs) I have a lot of things that I'm working on and I have a lot of these problems setting up a way for people to donate to us. Like we're creating an application for smartphones right now that is going to have built-in tipping stuff. And it would be great. And we have on the one side, like I I view this as solving the other end of another problem that I have. We're basically setting up a system called BitSplit. That's uh, an idea from uh, Kyle of uh, CoinTalk where you can essentially have an address route then out to multiple addresses that, you know, like one person could get 10%, one person could get 15%, one person could get 50%, and it's totally arbitrary. So this is kind of like the other side of that. If you attach this to the front of it, then you have a way for it to be totally private and still go through all this distribution automatically. Yep. Could you do it? I mean, like you're saying it doesn't... Well, say for instance, so for your, your application there, you want to be able to publish an address and take the funds that receive it and split it up. Now, as you know, by creating that singular address, you have the problem that if it gets reused, you lose some privacy there. So with a stealth address, what that would enable from your point of view is that your site would be publishing stealth addresses instead of normal Bitcoin addresses. So when I say made a donation that's supposed to be split up across, say, 10 parties, that donation would be not visible to anyone else on the blockchain or at least i should say it wouldn't be linkable to anyone else and i'd essentially generate a new addresses via the stealth method pay you your wallet software would see the money and then the next guy that comes along pays that address they see the money and it all works out i guess the important thing is so right now the main alternative is you have an interaction so let's suppose your website had a button that you'd click, you know, it's, you know, pop up a new address every single time a user wanted to donate. Right. That's all well and good. But by popping up a new address, you know, you, you have an interaction between you and them that you can't get rid of. And that's really what stealth addresses tries to avoid. So you don't have to have that overhead. Okay. As a normal user, if I wanted to implement something like this, what would that look like? Is this something that's still in a theoretical stage? Is it something where there are APIs out there and I can point a developer to it? It's not to the stage where there's tested APIs and tested implementations. It's at the stage where people are writing code to implement it and testing it out and making sure that, you know, things go work as expected. I personally am writing what I'm calling the stealth address reference implementation. And then I'm doing that in conjunction with the dark wallet slash lib Bitcoin guys who are also doing an implementation. And our goal there is that with two implementations, we can essentially make sure that they do interoperate in the actual specification that'll get written, you know, is correct and is something that then people like wallet authors can take and implement stealth addresses from that. Well, sounds great. Before we go on this one, you know, while I've got you here, you were brought on with the MasterCoin Foundation to address some of the complaints about the protocol and some of the incongruities in it. Can you address any of that? Uh, Can you talk about some of the work that you've done to to change the protocol and what some of those complaints were and how they were addressed? This could be an entirely different interview to, uh, you know, just throwing this out there. Yeah. So I'm legitimately, you know, I'm very curious. I guess the big thing I'll go say up front is you got to remember nobody in the decentralized finance space 
really knows 100% what's actually will or will not work. This is a field that just did not exist even, you know, maybe a year ago. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, that's, that's... So, yeah, it is very, very experimental. And I think what specifically has happened with MasterCoin is I think it's actually been a fair number of, of smaller changes, things like making sure that, you know, they, they understand their options, for instance, to make sure MasterCoin transactions aren't blocked, making sure that they understand the issues around consensus with MasterCoin. I think a big and very important one is I came up with a, what seems to be a reasonable way to upgrade these systems so that if, you know, you need to change MasterCoin and add a new feature or change how it works, we now believe we know how to upgrade it. And have an upgrade process that uh, operates smoothly. And I think more long-term then, you know, there's, and I'd say kind of, this is sort of the other half of what I'm working on. I'm more working on Bitcoin itself, making sure that Bitcoin can scale, making sure that the Bitcoin protocol itself works in a variety of ways, stays decentralized and so on. And fundamentally that's because MasterCoin depends on it as do all these other decentralized finance stuff with one exception of a, of a Ethereum. I believe NXT also uh, doesn't rely on it, but it's, you know, not using a blockchain like structure. I wouldn't necessarily call NXT uh, decentralized. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. Well, unfortunately their proof of stake all algorithm for consensus, it in turn depends on developer checkpoints. So without the developers, the proof of stake algorithm doesn't work. Hmm. Interesting. Peter, we're going to have to do a longer interview at another time. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, you know, this, I, you're into very big topics there. It's, a, it's yeah. a, that's completely true. It's a very big topic. And, you know, and it's such an interesting time right now because I think that, you know, you view yourself kind of like how I view myself, which is a free agent basically in this space. You know, there's yes. so much stuff going on. You really can't pick a team. It's just about looking at all the innovation and trying to learn from everything. And then at the end of this, we rewind up incorporating all the best elements into the same things because it's all open source anyways, right? That's absolutely true. And if anything, I think that's kind of one of the interesting things about Stealth Address is simply that on a technical level, it is actually fairly simple. So it's kind of nice to then have a project that, you know, I can reasonably see can kind of implemented in a relatively short period of time versus other stuff where... You know, the whole scope of what decentralized finance is going to do is just so complex and there's so many different moving parts that sometimes, you know, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. Peter Todd, Chief Scientist of the MasterCoin Foundation. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Foundation is a nonprofit charitable giving organization leveraging the power of the Bitcoin community to improve public health and the environment worldwide. Help us demonstrate the significant impact of Bitcoin in addressing these critical issues on a global scale. Support international giving in Bitcoin. Please visit our website at www.bitgivefoundation.org. That's www.bitgivefoundation.org.